I'm honored to be here today to celebrate Darwin. And thank you all for being here. I'm going to be talking about the history of vaccine. I'm going to be giving you information on diseases that are no longer common thanks to vaccinations. I'm going to give you some information on misconceptions and risks of vaccines. And ultimately, um, I'm going to give you information on how vaccines have impacted human health. So vaccines are among the greatest medical achievements of modern civilization. Back in the 18th century, one in three children would die due to infectious diseases. Childhood diseases that were only um, were, were present only a few generations ago are now absent because of vaccines. The World Health Organization and CDC estimates in the United States in the last 20 years that more than 21 million hospitalizations and 700,000 deaths have been saved due to vaccines. Smallpox is eradicated from the world thanks to vaccines. It's derived from the Latin word pox, which stands for spotted, which refers to the pus-filled blisters that occurs when you get the infection. It's caused by the variola virus, which is shown here, and it can be as high as 30% fatal if you get the infection. If you contract the disease and recover, you can be scarred for life. But what's interesting is once you get the disease once, you're very unlikely to get it again. Another interesting observation that was found out before the discovery of vaccines that helped in the development of the first one is cowpox can protect against smallpox. Farmers that would milk cows with these pustules would get small sores on their hands. And then if they were ever exposed to smallpox, they wouldn't get sick. So a scientist back in the, in the day, 1798, Dr. Edward Jenner took this information and performed the first experiment, made the first vaccine. He took cowpox pus from an infected hand of a woman, scratched it into an eight-year-old boy. He healed within two weeks with no major complications. And then Edward Jenner took smallpox from an infected patient who was really sick, scratched the boy's arm, inoculated him with smallpox, and the boy didn't get sick. He was protected. So this is an interesting paper, an inquiry into the causes and effects of the variola vaccine. He published this in 1798. It's online, you can read it today. It's all the cases of people that were protected by cowpox. So that's how we get the word vaccine. It's derived from the Latin word vacca, which means cow. But as you know, we get many vaccines, none of which are made from cows. So a more universal term would be immunizations today. So it only took 181 years later, in 1979, smallpox is eradicated from the world. There's no more human cases of smallpox, thanks to vaccines. So how does a vaccine work? Back when Edward Jenner performed his first experiments, they didn't even know what caused diseases. They thought they spontaneously generated out of swamps and uh, rotting material. They didn't even know what germs were, that the variola virus caused disease. It wasn't until these two fathers of microbiology came along that we could begin to understand what caused diseases. So Louis Pasteur was a French chemist. He was the first to make a rabies and anthrax vaccine. He disproved spontaneous generation. And his work laid the foundation for the germ theory of disease, that bacteria and viruses can cause disease. And then we have Robert Koch, who's a German uh, physician. And he really pioneered bacteriology. He found the causative agents of tuberculosis, cholera, and anthrax. And because of these two men, we now have the germ theory of disease, viruses, such as the variola virus causes smallpox. We have tuberculosis, a bacteria, a, a, a bacteria causes tuberculosis. We have fungus can cause valley fever. And we have malaria, a parasite. A parasite can cause malaria. And a more universal term or scientific term for germs would be pathogens. 
So now we can go back to the question, how does a vaccine work? And I, you need to start addressing what your immune system is. And your Im immune system is there to protect you against pathogens and invaders and infections. And you can think of the cells that circulate throughout your body as little ninja warriors that are out there to find those invaders and kill them with a swipe of a sword. And we have many immune cells. We have a ninja army in our body. We have neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, natural killer cells, and macrophages. All of those are part of our innate immune system, like our armor and shield that protects us against anything, not specific, and not important for understanding how a vaccine works. The cells that are important are your adaptive immune cells, your T cells, and your B cells. These elicit a specific response to one pathogen. They're like the specialized ninja warrior that knows one enemy and can kill them very quickly. And how do they do this? So B cells make antibodies, and antibodies are proteins that target a specific pathogen. In this picture, we have a bacteria. You can think of anti antibodies as a ninja star. It can be thrown at that enemy and targeted. And when that happens, your T cells can activate your B cells. And your body is able to make up to 10 billion different antibodies. You can recognize a lot of different pathogens, can't you? So when your T cells activate your B cells, they can then go through clonal expansion, make many more B cells and many more antibodies. And when this happens, this is the key to vaccines. Our body makes memory B cells. And they're the ninja war warriors that circulate throughout your body looking for that one pathogen. If it ever comes back again, it's going to be attacking it faster than it can hurt you. So vaccines help our bodies create memory B cells without making us sick. So what are vaccines made of? Vaccines contain non-infectious versions of pathogens. So we have subunit vaccines, which contain a portion of a bacteria. We have killed virus vaccines, and we have modified live viruses that no longer make us sick. And many times, a dead virus may not look dangerous to your immune system. So many times, we add adjuvants to help boost the efficiency of our ninja warriors to elicit an immune response and create B cells. And one very common adjuvant is aluminum. And you can think of it as a little bell that rings to get the attention of your ninja warrior. So if you look at our 2017 recommended immunization schedule, we have a lot of pathogens that we can prevent by vaccination. And if you look at the global childhood mortality rates since the beginning of vaccines in the 1800s to now, Deaths in the first five years of life have steadily declined, and vaccines play a major role in this decline. And here in the United States, the number of deaths is less than 1%. So if you go back to this recommended immunization list and you feel a little overwhelmed about the number of shots that you're getting, let me just remind you, what are some of the diseases that we're preventing by vaccinating? So I'll start with the polio virus. So polio is the next disease that we can eradicate from the world if we continue to stay committed to vaccinations. Polio is caused by a virus shown up here. It infects our nervous system, and one in 200 t children become paralyzed because of polio infections. This is a picture from 1952, a Los Angeles hospital respiratory ward where children who are sick with polio are in iron lungs to help assist them breathing. And actually, in 1955, Jonas Salk created the first vaccine for polio. And it only took 17 years to eradicate it from the United States. And today, we've almost eradicated it from the world. If you look at the number of global polio cases, they've steadily dropped since the introduction of the vaccine. However, the World Health Organization estimates that there's 415 cases in 2014, and in 2015, it's 106 cases. They're in Pakistan and Afghanistan, so there's still cases present on Earth that could put us at risk to getting polio even here if we stop vaccinating. 
So if you look at how easy travel has been made, you can see the dots on this picture are all the flights that take off in a single day. You can imagine how easy it is for an area where there's polio and an area where people stop vaccinating that there could be spread of disease again. So that's where herd immunity comes in so important. It can help prevent diseases. And what herd immunity refers to is the indirect protection that can occur when enough of the population is immunized and to protect against the disease from those that cannot get a vaccine, those such as infants that are too small to get some vaccinations, pregnant women, people who are immune compromised that have cancer, AIDS, or allergies. So let me give you a scenario of a classroom that has no herd immunity. There's 14 children here. Only four of them have been vaccinated against the polio vaccine. One kid goes off on vacation, comes back sick with polio. And if we go through this child, he plays with his two best friends, passes on polio. And then through a complex network of interactions, 10 children get sick and no one are protected by herd immunity. Now let's change the scenario up a bit and vaccinate eight children and try this again. Here, through this complex network of interactions, we have three children that have been protected by herd immunity that could not get the vaccine but are protected by those that could. So if we go back to our immunization list, polio is going to be the next disease eradicated from the world if we continue to be committed to this cause. And back when I got the polio vaccine, it was the oral polio vaccine, which had a small case of calling po causing poliomyelitis. So they've only improved it to help reduce the risk of that. Another disease that can be prevented by the DTaP vaccine is diphtheria, which is one of the most common causes of death back in the 1920s in children. It's caused by Carinibacterium diphtheriae. And diphtheria stands for the Greek word for leather, which refers to the thick membranous mucus that builds in the back of the throat that can close off your airways and cause suffocation and death. And what's interesting is this toxin is responsible for the diphtheria, the blockage of your airways. And it's not produced by the bacteria themselves necessarily, it's produced by a virus that infects the bacteria. And you look at the cases of diphtheria in the United States since the introduction of the vaccine in the 1920s to now, they've steadily decreased. And if you look at the number of cases that the World Health Organization has accounted for, there's 7,774 cases worldwide, only one in the United States. And the number dropped in 2015 to over 4,000 cases. So we're getting close to being able to eradicate this disease as well. Now, if those diseases didn't scare you, measles should. Measles can be prevented by the MMR vaccine. And actually, one dose of the vaccine can be as much as 93% effective at protecting us against getting measles. Now, if you were to contract measles and come in contact with 10 people that weren't vaccinated, nine of them would get sick with measles. This is highly contagious. It's caused by a virus shown up here. And this virus can cause rash. It can cause pneumonia. It can cause seizures. It can cause brain damage and death. And it was eradicated from the United States in 2000. But it's come back. And there was a case in, in Disneyland not too long ago. So you can see the number of cases have steadily declined, but our numbers around the world are very high. And in the United States, 667 cases in 2014. This is a vaccine-preventable disease. And in 2015, there was 188 cases, many of which were in the Disneyland area in California. Another disease that can be prevented by the MMR vaccine is mumps and it generally causes inflammation of the salivary gland, but it can lead to more complicated si uh, effects such as swelling of the testes in males. It can cause deafness and brain damage. 
And what's unfortunate about this, if you only get one shot of the MMR vaccine and not multiple doses, you can have this whole group get vaccinated, but maybe even as less than half could be protected from a mumps infection. And it, as you see, the number of cases of mumps has rised in the United States. This is not a complete list uh, recording of how many mumps cases there were in 2016, but it's over 5,000. So some vaccines require multiple doses to be efficient, and mumps is a very clear case of that. If you only get one dose, it can be as low as 49 effective against protecting you from mumps. If you have two doses, it can raise as low as 66 efficient. So it's important to get all of those doses of your MMR vaccine to protect you against mumps. And that also includes your ability to be um, protected by herd immunity. More of us need to be vaccinated to protect us from mumps infections. And when we stop vaccinating, we start seeing cases of mumps come up. And this is not far from home. Spokane, there was 152 cases of mumps. 91 people were vaccinated. And if that wasn't close enough to home, here at the University of Idaho, there's 21 confirmed cases of mumps, and it spread to Washington State. All right. The last vaccine-preventable disease I'll tell you about is tetanus. It's caused by a toxin from a soil-dwelling bacteria, Clostridium tetani, which is a spore-forming bacteria here, and it causes locked jaw and your muscles to contract. And if an infant gets tetanus, they mo most likely die. And this is easily preventable by a tetanus shot. But your memory B cells only circulate for about 10 years after your vaccine, so you need to get boosters to protect yourself against this disease. And the number of cases have steadily declined over the years since we've got the tetanus shot. But there was 25 cases in the US in 2014 and 30 cases in 2015. So why do some people fear vaccines? Well, there was a paper published in 1998 in The Lancet by Dr. Andrew Wakefield that said 12 children developed autism because of the MMR vaccine. Many scientists were worried about this, wondering what could be the cause of this development of autism. So many scientists around the world wanted to figure this out so they could solve this problem, make vaccines safe. And nobody could repeat the data that Andrew Wakefield published. No one saw a link between the MMR vaccine and autism. And actually, there, is more, there are way more than 20 articles out there today that show that there's no correlation between MMR vaccine and autism. And one of my favorites, since these are too small to see, is in Denmark. They have their medical records made public so they can have sample sizes of children as many as 500,000 to study. And they looked at the number of children that were vaccinated with MMR and those that, those that did not, and their rates of autism were the same. They also looked at the number of doses they got. If they got one dose of the MMR vaccine versus multiple, and their rates of development of autism were the same. They also looked at components of vaccines, such as thimerosal. And they saw there was no difference between the cases of autism with those children that got thimerosal-containing vaccines versus those that did not. So, a lot of people started looking into this paper from 1998, and they started doing an investigation and found falsified information that the 12 children that were selected for this small study were actually pre-selected by lawyers that had already developed autism, and they were trying to sue the vaccine company. And Andrew Wakefield was being funded by these lawyers. So this paper was retracted, but the damage was already done. People were afraid of vaccines. And autism is on the rise. Part of it has to do with a better diagnostic. We now include autism and autism spectrum disorder together. But still, one in 68 children are, are diagnosed with autism. So the important question is, is what is causing autism? And we don't know the full answer to this yet, and many researchers are studying it right now. But it looks like it's 
not just a simple genetic mutation, but genetics play a role in this disease. So do environmental factors, especially during the development of the fetus during pregnancy, what the, the mother's exposed to. It's clear that men are more likely to get autism than females. An identical twin, one that develops autism, the second one's more likely to develop autism as well, rather than just a sibling. People with fragile X syndrome, a single mutation, are more likely to develop autism. So there's a lot of work being done in this, but there's been no link to childhood vaccines and the development of autism. So, since there's a concern about the safety of vaccines, what's in our vaccines and why are they there? The first one is formaldehyde. It's very important for killing and inactivating viruses and bacteria during manufacturing. This is formaldehyde right here. And actually, our body produces more formaldehyde by eating an apple than anything we'd get from a vaccine. Our body normally makes formaldehyde and can break it down. We can secrete it out in our urine and we can breathe it out as CO2. And actually, a good example of why we need formaldehyde to help kill our viruses is the Cutter incident in 1955. In Berkeley, California, the polio vaccine was being made and not enough formaldehyde was added to inactivate the polio virus. And some live polio virus got into our vaccines. A thousand or 120,000 children were vaccinated. 200 were paralyzed and 10 died because of this. So formaldehyde has made our vaccine safer and we need to add enough to kill off those viruses. Some vaccines contain thimerosal. And thimerosal can prevent contamination of bacteria and fungus in multi-dose vaccine vials. Those that you, have to, you can use to vaccinate multiple children, you have to insert a new clean needle each time. Each introduction of a new needle can potentially contaminate that vaccine vial. And one common organism that's been shown in the past before thimerosal was used is Staph aureus, which grows naturally in many people's noses, doesn't cause sickness in them, but could kill someone else. And the World Health Organization estimates that thimerosal has saved 1.4 million lives thanks to preventing contamination with things like Staph aureus. Now, thimerosal contains mercury, and we know mercury, some forms of mercury, can be neurotoxins, and especially at high levels. But the mercury that we've studied so, so thoroughly is methylmercury, which builds up in our fish. Now, this is an ethyl mercury. And when scientists look at the difference between how our body breaks down and processes ethyl mercury compared to methyl mercury, they found that ethyl mercury very quickly gets secreted out of our bodies much faster than methyl mercury does. And we have such low levels in our vaccine, none of our children vaccines have thimerosal in them except for the flu shot. And there are versions that don't have thimerosal. Some vaccines contain antibiotics. And this is to help prevent contamination as well. Human viruses grow best in human cells. And these human cells need a lot of nutrients to grow. So antibiotics such as neomycin, polymyxin B, gentamicin and streptomycin are used. But the amount that we get are so small in our vaccine. If you have allergies, this could be a concern though. So this would be something you could discuss with your doctor. Another thing that's part of vaccines, commonly found in vaccines, are stabilizers such as gelatin. And gelatin's found in your jellies, lunch meats, and jams. Gummy bears here too. And they're there to protect active ingredients from degradation during manufacturing, storage, and during the use of vaccines. And in a good example of why we need stabilizers, if you remember this from the diphtheria page, this is diphtheria toxin. It's very stable. But its antitoxin isn't very stable. And during the 1920s, when they first made the vaccine with toxin and antitoxin, when there was a cold winter, the vaccine th froze and then thawed, all the antitoxin broke down without a stabilizer. And children got just the toxin, which is deadly. 
Now we don't have toxin antitoxin. Now we just have toxoid, which is a, a version of the diphtheria toxin that's not dangerous. I told you that our vaccines have adjuvants to help boost our immune system. And one common adjuvant is aluminum. This is there so we, have to use, so we can use less virus, less toxin, and still have a robust immune response so our memory B cells are made. We can have also a longer lasting immune respo response with aluminum. And we may need even less doses of the vaccine to be effective with aluminum. Now, aluminum is one of the most prevalent metals on Earth. It's in our air, soil, and our water. We come in contact with it on a daily basis. And our body can process it. We need our kidneys to get rid of our aluminum. So no vaccine is 100% safe. And you must weigh your risks versus your benefits. And if you look at the number of doses of vaccines that are given, you can see that one in a million doses of vaccine result in compensation, and some of these compensations are as mild of conditions as fevers. But there is a risk. If you are allergic to neomycin or gelatin or aluminum, or if you have kidney problems or you can't process these chemicals, you may be at risk and you may have to rely on herd immunity for your protection against diseases. And every state has a medical exemption for vaccines. But if you don't have any risk or allergies, or you're not too young to be vaccinated, you have to think about the benefit of you being able to prevent yourself from getting sick and from others from getting sick, and for the eradication of diseases that have caused so much harm to human life. So vaccines are very effective. We've eradicated smallpox from the world. We've almost eradicated polio from the world. And many diseases are under control today. We need to work on mumps and measles, but we're close. And they've hugely impacted human health. They're here to help us and our children live long, healthy lives. Thank you very much.